Awesome. I pray that everyone is well on today. Uh, this is Pastor Hagwood of First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. Uh, I know this looks different. I'm doing this via Zoom on tonight. Um, I see that uh, the focus is trying to go in and out, and y'all just have to bear with me uh, in regards to um, in regards to uh, Zoom, because I have to check my phone for comments, and there is a little bit of a delay on Facebook Live, so you all have to uh, just, again, bear with me in regards to that. I have to take a look, actually, on my post um, um, on our First Mile Zion. There we go. Uh, just to make sure on our page, I'm looking at my phone so I can have everything there. You're probably like, well, Pastor, you all in outer space, and there's the earth, and all this stuff. Um, again, I just want to try something different. Because uh, I hadn't done a live uh, cast on Zoom in a while, uh, especially for study. So I figured I would try to do this tonight, uh, and hopefully it will be um, helpful for you, uh, because I do have some materials uh, that I want to show, uh, more so scripture, and also um, uh, have, have a map that I'm going to show on tonight as we get into Acts chapter 13. So again, with that, I pray that you're well, uh, that, that you're well, and that you're prospering even as your soul prospers. And uh, we're going to dig right into our lesson for tonight, um, which is, again, Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with regards to, again, the lesson for tonight. Um, again, first Mount Zion family, please keep in mind that, again, we're back in uh, in-person worship uh, at First Mount Zion. Of course, virtual worship always happens. Uh, that won't go away because that's the, that's the environment that we're in right now. So uh, again, 10 o'clock uh, a.m. right now, Sunday school will be virtual up until March 20th. March 20th, we will actually have mass Sunday school, uh, which will be at the church in the sanctuary. And then within the next month, we're going to try to figure out how to get back to in-class uh, instruction. But we want to make sure that we are being very, very um very cautious in that regard. So you'll be hearing more in regards to that. I think April 24th, right after Resurrection Sunday, uh, we're going to move to our classrooms as well as to Children's Church uh, in about another month because we got to get things set up for that, get the building adequately clean and things of that nature, what Children's Church is, is and, uh, and begin that process. So uh, again, I, I pray that you're well on tonight. Uh, I know it's been a tedious week for many. You know, for me, it has as well. But I pray that God is still prospering you and giving you what you need, the energy that you need, the fortitude, the strength uh, that's needed in order to continue through this journey of life and what the path that God has you on. So with that being said, I want to have a word of prayer first before we get into our study tonight. Again, we're going to be in Acts chapter 13 verses 1 through 12. That's where we're going to focus in on tonight. So I ask that you pray with me at this time. Let's pray. Most eternal and all wise God, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, thank you Lord, for this day and thank you for all that you continue to do, oh Lord, in our lives. We ask right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you meet us in this place, that you give us what we need, oh Lord, for this study on tonight. Lord, thank you for the technologies that have been afforded to us, oh God. We just ask that things work properly, oh God. Uh, in the midst of streaming, so that we can make sure this broadcast goes forward throughout the highways and hedges all over the ends of the earth, oh God, so that the word of God may be taught, may be rendered, may be, um, uh, may, may, may be learned, oh Lord, may be saturated in, so that people will have a better understanding and connection to you as we study this book of Acts. Bless us now and keep us and give us what we need on the journey of life. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So with that being said, I want to get into the lesson uh, again on tonight. Again, Acts chapter 13 uh, is where we're going to be, uh, and uh, verses 1 through 12 um, uh, in particular. So with that being said, uh, before I get into the scripture, I want to kind of talk about very quickly um, what we talked about last week uh, or, the week or two weeks ago because we didn't have to study last week. Uh, I was trying to get a little bit of reprieve and rest. Um, uh, just been busy, but uh, we're back on today. So on, um, we talked about, you know, the, the, the pinpointing of Cornelius and Peter, okay? Uh, I think that's where we left off. I'm just kind of going through 
Um, yes, actually, after that, when Peter was actually arrested and actually was thrown in prison, and the angel actually liberated him past the guards and so forth, the mere miraculous um, rescue, if you will, of Peter out of the prison, and then also the death of Herod, um, the death of Herod, who was um, trying to hold Peter, okay, um, trying to actually hold Peter, and again, you can listen to that lesson, uh, you can go back to our YouTube page uh, and actually find that uh, on our YouTube page uh, under our first Mount Zion logo, but um, we see the, the miraculous aspects of not only the release, but also how uh, Peter ends up showing up uh, back at, I think, I forgot whose house it was. I'm reading the scripture here. Um, I think it was John Mark's mother, if I'm not mistaken, at her home. And um, then uh, someone was knocking at the door. And of course, he ends up going and, um, and they realize that it's Peter. And he tells them a story about how uh, the angel came and released him out of prison uh, and so forth. They were gathering basically at John Mark's mother's house. That's my understanding. I'm reading here. Um, yes, Mary, the mother of John Mark. And so they were actually gathering at their house. But what I told you before was that the, the early church, that's what they used to do. They, they, get, they gathered at people's churches, uh, at, at people's houses. That was church. And so because of that, there became a connection, if you will, with regards to uh, going from house to house. And that was what church was, okay, um, during that time. And so these small groups in these pockets of churches, uh, basically at people's houses, and that's where they would gather. Well, Peter goes to Mary's house, uh, the mother of John Mark. Um, they see he's out of prison. He tells them of the story. And then we also find out and also, that Herod, excuse me, that Herod ends up dying. Um, and literally, um, and he literally, because he would not give praise to God, an angel struck him down. Uh, and basically, he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. And that's where we ended two weeks ago, is we see this path of the church continuing to grow. And despite calamity and despite uh, circumstances that would be adverse, we still see this adage, if you will, of, um, of the movement, if you will, of the church, okay? The movement of the church continuing to grow in spite of tribulation, in spite of trial. And this is some of the things that we need to understand as we continue to read this book, because we're seeing the birth of the church, okay? And we see the ebbs and flows, the many vicissitudes, both positive and negative, pessimistic and optimistic, that continue to happen. However, the church continues to grow. And this is something that I think we all need to take, um, take heed to because truly God's church is going to continue to flourish. It doesn't matter about the number of people. There's no requirement on the population of the size of the church. The reality is that Christ's church would never die, okay? And I think this is something that we have to keep in mind uh, even when we get discouraged, you know, and, and especially times like these, um, when, when, when church looks different now, um, when gathering together looks different, that the same God is the same, the same God that we're worshiping, back, that we worship back in is the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. That's what the scripture said, tell us. So we need to keep that in mind as we, kind of sojourn and move forward in regards to our walk in faith and relationship with God, okay? So that's where we ended two weeks ago, and now we're in chapter number 13, okay? And what we're now going to see is the beginning of particular excursions that um, Barnabas and Paul and others will begin venturing on in order to uh, promote the message of Jesus Christ, okay? And to promote the faith by way of Jesus Christ. And so with that being said, I want to get into our text on today. And y'all have to uh, bear with me because I told you I got phones going and a host of other things just to make sure that we are monitoring um, this appropriately, um, you know, with regards to our study on tonight. But I just want to make sure that all of us, you know, gather um, 
what this word is telling us tonight. So again, you all just bear with me. I'm on my phone now trying to uh, pull things up and, and I'm hitting long buttons. <laughs> y'all forgive me, y'all. Um, trying to hit a volume button, but it's not working because I'm hitting the wrong button. That's why. Um, let me, okay, there we go. There we go. Because I wanted to see some captions here on tonight so we can kind of go through the process of talking what we're going to talk about. Now, here we go. I'm going to share this with you all. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and when I do that, probably going to double back. Yes, that's what I wanted to see. Okay, so what we're going to do now is and hopefully everyone will see that. I'll see this here at the uh, bottom of the top because um, what I'm doing is I'm showing basically the Bible and I'm using uh, Bible Gateway. Uh, this is what I uh, sometimes used for study and so far. i got other programs that I also use from that perspective. But what I want you to do and see, and I know you're like, oh, this is nice, Pastor. You need to have this every, every week. Uh, well, we'll try. <laughs> That's all I'll say. So this is our scripture for, the, uh, for tonight. Um, Acts 13 uh, from the New International Version of God's Word. And this is what it says, verses 1 through 12. That's all we're going to focus on tonight. It says, now in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, uh, Simeon called Niger, uh, Lucius of Cyrene, uh, Menin, um, or Menane, who had been brought up with Herod, the, uh, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the works to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But, um, but uh, Eli Elimus, or Elimus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with, their, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at uh, uh, Elimus and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the rights, the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw that saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. And may it truly sanctify us to the deepest roots of our heart. Now, I'm going to take my share off, or at least I'm going to try to um, at this time. And um, and hopefully it'll work. So y'all just have to bear with me. There it is. And it, and stop sharing. There we go. So that's our, that was our word for tonight. Okay. I'm going to share my screen again for, for something else I'm going to show you. But what we're seeing is this element of, again, we see all these individuals at the very beginning. So um, um, we see uh, Simeon, I called uh, Niger, uh, uh, Barnabas, 
Okay, Lucius of Serene, Menin, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. My understanding that uh, uh, Menin, I think Menin or Menin, um, was actually a step, uh, like a step brother, if I'm not mistaken. Let me read, I'm reading from one of my commentaries. Um, yes. Yeah, actually was a foster brother of Herod Antipas, okay? Was a stepbrother uh, of Herod Antipas. And he now is a follower of Christ, okay? So what we're seeing is a consistent uh, consistent theme, um, consistent theme with regards to individuals who have tried to stop the spread of the gospel. However, those that are around them and those that are in their families and so forth are beginning the process of moving towards faith in Jesus Christ, okay? Even for the individuals like Herod, Herod Antipas who attempted to stop it, okay? Also, I want you to also notice something else. One, one of the other main things that you see here in this passage in the very beginning is that um, now in the church at Antioch, okay? Remember, Antioch was a heavy trading post, okay? Uh, a lot of ships would come. There was a port city. So many, um, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manan, and also Saul, who we know as Paul. Now, I want you to see something here, because what we see here is that is this man by the name of Simeon, who they called Niger, okay? Now, given his name, he was more than likely a Jew. But because they called him Niger, because they called him Niger, implies two, two possible things. And, make, and both, one is definitely true. Both could be true. The first thing that I think definitely is true is one day he's a Jew, okay? That we can denote him and know that he is a Jew. The other piece is, is that if they called him Niger, Niger, Niger means, uh, and I think I forgot what language it actually is, and I want to give you give that to you as well. But um, y'all forgive me because I'm, I'm, I'm reading, <laughs> reading y'all. Um, it's the Latin, okay? So Niger, which we know there's a country in Africa called Niger, that Niger in Latin actually means black, okay? So Simeon, who they call Niger, more than likely Simeon was a dark complected person. That that he 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 looked um, um, of African descent, and also possibly could have been of African descent. So so we know Simeon of Niger, who was a Jew, uh, but also was possibly from the continent of Africa, because uh, again they called him Niger. They called him Niger, and Niger literally in in uh, Latin means black uh, because of the context of his skin. Okay. Also, we see Lucius of Cyrene. Now we know Cyrene is in Africa because that at the time was the was the capital, um, the capital of Libya. Okay. Um, and now we know it as Tripoli um, in, in Libya. But 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 Lucius is from Africa, and he's one of the um missionaries, if you will, and folks in the in the church, excuse <coughs> me, in the church at Antioch. Okay, so we see this plethora of individuals, okay, that are now housed at the church in Antioch and in Antioch. So it gives you a little backdrop of, of who they are. And it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas, <coughs> Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now watch this. So the spirit of the Lord speaks and says, set Barnabas and Saul apart for some work, ministry work that God's going to do through them. Okay. So <clears throat> in adhering to the Holy Spirit, they set them apart. Not only do they set them apart, but they make it a point. Said after they had fasted, they had worshiped. After they had fasted and prayed, 
they laid their hands on them. Now, this, this is an act that we see, we see in the book of Acts. We see it in many other areas of the Bible. <clears throat> when someone lays hands on you, okay, in a ecumenical setting, what they're doing is, in a church setting, what they're doing is, is they're consecrating you but through a process of consecration to ultimately send you off, <laughs> send you off somewhere to do the work of the Lord. Y'all excuse me for a second. Very similar to the ones that they had called um, in chapter, Act chapter six, the deacons they had called. <clears throat> so what they did was, they put their hands on them to consecrate them to pray over their protection, their safety, all those things before they sent them off. And where were they going? They were going to go to Cyprus. Okay? They were going to go to Cyprus. So there's now a level of a missionary journey that's going to happen. And probably we can look at it as it's kind of the first missionary journey of the church by Barnabas and Saul, okay? So here's a setup with regards to this missionary journey. Now, let's go a little further. What we have here now is, um, I wanna read really verses four. Yeah, let me read verse four um, down to, Really about verse, probably verse six, verse uh, eight, excuse me. And it reads, it says, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper, meaning John Mark, okay? They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Bar means son of, okay? And then Bar, son of Jesus, but it wasn't the son of Jesus. It was the son of someone named Joshua, okay? But we end up finding out who his real name is, which is uh, his, well, his name, which they called him um, Elamites which actually means magician or sorcerer. Let me keep reading. Um, um, so a false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, uh, Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of the Lord. So Bar-Jesus was the, was the proconsul. He was an attendant to the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, okay? who of course we probably know he was probably Roman because they're under Roman occupation because of the Roman Empire. Now, it says, let me read, let me read a little bit further. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sits for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But um, Elimus, Elimus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, okay? Opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Let me stop right here. So background, geographically. So we see, and I'm about to share my screen again so that y'all can see it. Now just give me a second. There we go. Now. So this right here is um, and hopefully y'all can see this. There we go. Okay. So what this is, is a map that I pulled up. And what you see here in this map um, is a host of things. And, and actually where, um, if you look to the right in the, in, and look to the right and kind of in the middle of the page, this was the known world at this time. And one of the things that you'll see is... Um, You'll see Damascus if you look down, kind of down below in, in, uh, in Syria. And then, of course, you look down at the bottom of the page, you'll see Egypt. And to look to the right of that, you'll see Jerusalem. Well, if you look above 
Jerusalem and go up to uh, whereas Syria to the right and then go over to the left a little bit, right by the Mediterranean Sea, you'll see Antioch. Then you see where Antioch is positioned. Okay, so we know it as a trade city and you see how close it is to the Mediterranean Sea. But what we see here is, is that, what we see here is that, um, y'all forgive me because I'm going through all my stuff. Um, what we see here is this positioning, if you will, of um, where they are in Antioch. And when the prophets and when they laid hands on them after they had worshiped, fasted and prayed, laid hands on them, what we see, what we basically see is um, them going from Antioch to Seleucia, okay? And that's what the Bible says. So it says when they arrived, um, and I'm reading here. Yes. So the two of them set out on the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah, yeah. Verse four. Sit on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia. So you see where Seleucia is. Okay, right there beside Antioch. And then it says, and then and, and sailed from there to Cyprus. So you see where Seleucia is, and you see where Cyprus is. And they sailed to that town called Salamis. We see that right here in the Bible. It says, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper, John Mark. Okay, so this gives you a little background of what, what's going on. So they sailed from, uh, Salute, from Seleucia to Salamis. Okay, let's read a little bit further again. And they proclaimed the word in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as a helper. They traveled the whole island until they came to Paphos. So you see where Paphos is in Cyprus. It's way on the other side of the island. So they traveled, my understanding between Salamis and Paphos, Paphos is about 100 miles. So they actually traveled from there, and they were preaching and teaching throughout the whole island. Um, and getting to Papos, okay? And there they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, okay? Basically, son of Joshua. That's, that was basically his name. Who was an attendant of the proconsul, uh, Serg Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for, uh, Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, well, that is what his name means, opposed them and, and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith, okay? This is where we just stopped. Now, I want you to see something here, okay? Um, I put the map up just for a ge geographical purpose so you can kind of see all these places in the Bible they keep talking about. I don't know where they are. Well, I just talked, we're talking about this passage and I showed you where all these parts and pieces were. The amazing thing about this is that Bar Jesus, who we know is Elimus later, he's an attendant to the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, who is an intelligent man who, who sent for uh, Barnabas and Saul. He sent for them so that he could hear the word of the word of the Lord. Remember, he's a Roman, but he wants to hear about the word of the Lord. However, Bar Jesus, son of Joshua, Elimus, same person. He's trying to stop Barnabas and Paul from teaching the proconsul. And that's where that verse uh, eight comes in. That, um, but Elimus, the sorcerer, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. And what the reason why I'm stopping here is because th these are the consistent battles that the church of today that the church in the first century, which we're reading in Acts, and also the church of today, continues to face. And the, and the whole point of this is that there are some individuals and people that do not want anyone to proclaim the name of Christ at all, at all. And this is the consistent battle, whether it be the, whether it be the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and Sadducees, whether it be other people in the Roman government, it really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, what you see is that there's always this consistent, consistent, 
consistent upheaval that's always contending against the church, okay? Now, why am I saying this? I am saying this for the sake of motivation and encouragement for the church of 2022, because we are facing many troubles of many kinds, but the Lord perseveres through them all, and he uses us by way of our faith in order to still communicate that same message that Jesus Christ still saves, that Jesus Christ is still alive, and that as long as you have breath in your body, you can still have salvation and security and protection in Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so important for us to always be holding up the lamp, always holding up the light, okay? That's why it's so important for us to continue to go through the process of holding up the light of Christ, because it is important for the sake of those who don't know or have not made the choice of Jesus Christ. Will we? Will everyone be saved? No, because everyone will not choose, but there will be some. There will be some that will choose Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. But this is the contention that we continue to see in the church, okay, or against the church. And this is what Barnabas and, 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 um, and, and Paul are having to contend with in the midst of the church, in the midst of them uh, doing a missionary journey to Cyprus in order to teach and preach the word of the Lord, but also finding contention and always headbutting against the naysayers, okay? I had to bring all that up because this is something that is definitely part of this narrative, which I believe and hope will help to center us as we continue to propel forward, uh, even in these difficult times of COVID, that the church is still relevant, okay? That we are still gathering, that we're still preaching and teaching the word of God. We're still encouraging. We're still helping. We're still trying to feed folks who are hungry. We're still trying to do all those things that Christ has asked us to do. And also, there are individuals that are still contending against the church and contending against what um, Christ's church and what Christ is all about, okay? So I want you to see that. Um, again, I hope this map gives you a little picture, at least of, um, you know, of what we're talking about in the text, um, and also to see how this missionary journey kind of begins, okay? That you see this port city of Antioch, Seleucia, then they go all the way, they go over to uh, Cyprus and um, travel the entire island pretty much from Salamis all the way to Papos, um, to each opposite ends of, of that island, preaching and teaching the word of God, okay? And saving souls, okay? And this is how we have to have encouragement to continue to push forward, continue to be motivated and pushing forward um, in what uh, God wants us to do as missionaries, okay, and, um, you know, to go throughout Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth uh, and, and preaching and proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord, okay? That's why I think it's so important for us to see the first century church, because it begins the process of telling us and showing us what, uh, kind of what it takes uh, to go through trials and tribulations of many kinds, if you will, uh, in order to be effectual uh, uh, servants for the Lord in the mission of the church, in the great commission of the church, okay? Let's read a little bit further. Verse nine. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You will never stop perverting the way, the right ways of the Lord. Now the hand, now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time and not even able to see the light of the sun. Now I want you to see something here. Paul makes it a point 
to address alignments directly, okay? We, we believe that God is speaking through Paul, okay, in, 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 the, in, this, in this instance. And what happens is something that is very similar to what Paul himself experienced, okay? The reality becomes that many, when you've gone through an experience of transformation, whatever your experience may be, okay, whatever, um, however God dealt with you on a particular thing, okay, what you ended up finding was, was that one, there was the reality of God, you had this theophanic experience, um, you know, similar to, you know, Moses at the burning bush and many other things that we see in the Bible, okay, and it opens your eyes, opens your eyes to what God uh, was doing, Okay, opens your eyes to what God was trying to tell you. Okay, and you end up facing some level of punishment, possibly like Paul did, um, like Paul did, and even Elimus to the point where he gets knocked off his beast in chapter nine. He can't see for three days. Okay, can't see for three days, and then someone is sent to where he is so that he can see. Okay, so. Paul tells Elimus, he says, you're full of deceit, you're full of trickery. I'm reading all these things he talks about um, in these verses. He says, you're a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is, right, that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery, and you will never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. And this is what Paul intrinsically experienced himself. Because in that, I can only imagine how Paul was even feeling. He's like, Elimus, you don't get it. And you got too much trickery and hatred the things you're doing come right from Satan because guess what? That's where I used to be. That's what Paul was probably thinking, that I, I wanted to kill and persecute Christians, those who were professing the faith of Christ. But now God has got his hand against you like he had his hand against me. But thank God that experience saved me and got me to the place where I am right now. And sometimes, sometimes it takes going through a chastising experience. It, it takes catching a couple of licks or getting the full-fledged belt of the whooping, of a, of, of a spiritual whooping, if you will, for God to deal with us and to humble us to the point of his power, of, of his almightiness, if you will, the divinity of God. And it brings us into a real, again, a very sensitive and humbling experience that begins to suppress those things that are against God because we see a power greater than ourselves acting either on us or against us, sometimes even both at the same time. And I think this is where the transformation piece kind of come, begins to take place. Now, when we read the last verse, we don't know exactly where that comes in. We, we don't know if, uh, if Elimus actually will believe later. We, we don't know. We don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us that. But remember what he was trying to do. He was trying to discredit and to deny the power of God and the salvation of Christ to Sergio Paulus, who was a Roman who wanted to hear the word of God from two of God's servants, Paul, uh, Paul Barnabas and Paul, okay? And I want to say something to you uh, even now that whatever the will of God is for his word to go forth, there's nothing you can do. 
Okay, we've read that in, in the book of Acts. That if it's God's will for his word to go forward, it will go forward. You can guarantee that. Okay, you can guarantee that it's going to go forward. But you cannot try to go against God, and there's nothing that you can do to stop it. I'm speaking those words of Gamaliel that, that he spoke. Okay, that there's nothing you can do to stop it. If it's God's will for it to happen, you need to just sit back because if you try to even interfere with it, you may find yourself hurt and extremely hurt, if you will. And, and the reason why I say all this is because, again, we must have enough faith in what God has instituted for his church and to realize that the projection of the gospel that goes forward in the church will continue. It will keep going. You know, God says that's enough. Okay? So we have to have enough faith in that regard. But remember, you can't fight with God. You cannot. And you definitely can't fight with trying to keep, of trying to keep um, people who are yearning for his word, trying to keep them away from actually receiving it. Something to think about. Okay? But I think for the church, it should be motivation. It should really electrify our spirit. It really should do that. Uh, to know that regardless of what's going on, we still have to have enough faith to push forward and to keep doing what God through Christ has told us to do and instructed us to do and do it in faith. And don't worry about the repercussions. God will take care of all that. God will take care of it. All we've been asked is to be obedient to what God has instructed us to do. That's all we need to do. That's all we need to do. Okay? I hope, I hope that gives you some, some support, motivation, and encouragement because um, I, I just know so many Christians right now, and definitely Christian leaders, who are exhausted. I'm going to tell you that as a pastor, I'm exhausted. Okay, I'm exhausted uh, because last two years, it has just been trying to pivot, so many pivots to the point where it's, it, it can even become some, like cumbersome. It can become just overwhelming, if you will. But God has remained true. And even if I don't have the strength at the moment, I know finishing this day off, you know, and, and you know, getting before you today, um, that, you know, I, physically I kind of felt weak, you know, felt weak, was tired. But I, I prayed and just asked God, just give me a little bit, just give me enough so I can push to get this word out because it means that much to the kingdom of God. Not to just my profession as a pastor and one called in ministry, but to be able to have enough strength and ask God for the strength to be able to exhaust so that many more people are blessed and encouraged and motivated as well as myself by what the word of God tells us. Even the trials and tribulations that we see and how Others have overcame those trials and tribulations in the first century church. And in the church of the day, these are the things that we are you know, challenged with. However, let's continue to keep our faith, faith resident in God and in Christ. I believe he will continue to give us the strength to push forward and to do what he's called us to do. Okay? Um, oh, verse 12, verse 12. Let me get into the last piece of this. Um, actually, read 11 and 12. It says, now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. He couldn't even go anywhere without somebody guiding him by his hand, Okay. Uh, 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 Elias, okay? Verse 12, and it says, let's listen to this. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. You see this? So for what, so for what Elias tried to stop, he couldn't. Sergio Paulus, the proconsul, 
believed in the Lord because he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. And he says, when the proconsul saw what had happened to Elias, that he couldn't, that he was blind, and he had to be led by the hand, it gave further proof for Elias, for, uh, not Elias, but for, um, for Sergio Paulus to accept Christ because he realized that truly this is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And because he is, I'm going to believe. Because I'm going to believe, I'm going to stretch forward and I'm going to push forward because I have seen the miracle of God happen against someone who tried to go against his word, who tried to stop me from believing. And that became proof. That became proof for Sergio Paul. And I want to ask you a question. What, what, what will it take you to believe? This sermon two weeks ago. Um, are you still not convinced that Jesus Christ is Lord? All I would tell you is this, is that each person has to, has to really gather that for themselves and come to the decision uh, of whether they're going to believe in Christ and serve him or not. Ultimately, that's what it boils down to. And I think that when we begin to understand this uh, more and more, and especially in, in reading the book of Acts, hopefully it will give us that much more motivation um, it will help to trigger some things in our mind and our heart um, as to why we believe, if we are, are already believers, and for others, why they should believe, or why you should believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and submit to him. Um, again, this is the back and forth tug of the church, but we see on the missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas, are preaching and teaching that word. And there's some that are convinced and some that aren't. And it's not for us to, to slam the Bible down someone's throat. All we need to do is to teach it, teach it accurately, to show Jesus in so many different ways so that they can come to the belief that he is Savior and that he is Lord. And that's it. That's really it. Um, we're going to be done a little early tonight. Um, I'll go, go, go about 47, 50 minutes tonight with regards to this study. Uh, yeah, may God bless you. May heaven smile upon you in every way, shape, fashion, and form. I am going to have a word of prayer. Uh, again, I hope you enjoyed kind of the Zoom format that I put uh, together for the study. Uh, I just wanted to do something different rather than you staring at a yellow wall <laughs> uh, on tonight. So, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Um, announcements for the week will be coming out uh, hopefully the next time. Uh, don't come out tonight, don't come out tomorrow um, for the week and so forth. Uh, and please be mindful of uh, the things that are going on at First Mountain Zion uh, because we're back in the building and we're starting to kind of you know, move toward you know, things that we would do. We're not going full stretch, but uh, we're slowly uh, starting to get things going again and, and doing things. Uh, of course, within the church. And of course, we're back in worship um, now. So again, 10 o'clock on Sundays. Uh, Sunday school will still be virtual for the next, um, for one more week. And then we'll be doing mass Sunday school uh, on March 20th. We'll make sure that's on Facebook Live as well. Again, may God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Uh, let's have a word of prayer before we uh, dismiss on tonight. Let us pray. Most eternal and all wise God, thank you, Lord, for the study. Thank you, Lord, that uh, even when there are others who aren't convinced and are trying to sway uh, other people who are in intrigue, who are trying to investigate who Jesus is all about and what the salvation gift is all about, that, Lord, your word will still remain true. It will supersede all other words. And, Lord, those who are seeking your truth and wish to believe in faith that you died and was buried and rose three days later, all power in your hand, and you're alive today. 
will be saved. Thank you, Lord, for all what we studied tonight. Thank you, Lord, for these mediums, Lord, of Zoom and the internet, Lord, just to be able to show scripture and show maps and things of that nature, oh God, just makes it more interactive uh, from that perspective. Thank you, Lord, for all that you continue to do. Bless us now and keep us and give us what we need on the journey, and we'll be careful to give your name praise, honor, and glory. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am Pastor Eshawn Hagwood. I'm the pastor of uh, First Mount Pine Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessings to you. Y'all take care and have a blessed evening. Take care and be blessed.